Hi everyone, welcome back to Advancing with Watercolor. I'm Gary Tucker and today I'm going to be talking specifically about color. I talked about it in a previous video and I did this demonstration of a drill that I like to use in getting to know my colors. I think it's really helpful to get to know the particular colors that you use, how they work together, how they dilute, how they move across the paper, all these properties. And so I recommend that you have a look at this video and practice the drill with your own colors. Also, what I'd like to do is build a painting from some of the strategies that came out of these colors. So I'm going to be using the same four colors that I used in this exercise to make a painting. I'm also going to use this as an opportunity to talk about some color strategy. And by that, I mean ways in which we think about color and use color to, record, to portray any sort of motif. One of the things I'm going to be talking about is identifying a mother color or a major color in your scene and how to use that in forming your color plan. I'm going to be talking about what its complementary color might be and how we can use that. I'm also going to be talking about some things that I think are um, detriments or ways that you can get confused with color. One of those is by chasing the color of your subject. So we're going to do all that today in our lesson and get a painting done. So let's get started. Well, before we get started, I'd like to uh, recommend that you look at the description under this video because there I've included a link to a PDF uh, file that accompanies this video and in some cases presents more information than I'm able to present here. Um, also in the description you can see links to videos that talk about the same subject, so I recommend you take a few minutes to look at the description. So we're now looking at our motif for the day, which is a photograph of the bridge at the Boston Public Gardens. And one of the things I noticed right away is the abundance of warm colors. It's autumn, and of course our trees are changing color from red to deeper red, from yellow to green, etc. And uh, I say this because one of the first things I look for in my motif is a major hue, a mother color, if you will. And uh, this gives me a groundwork to start to build the painting. Now I'm going to be building the color in the same way that, um, that I did uh, in the drill, if you remember, where we're placing pure color on the page and then mixing it on the paper. So now I'm placing some yellows, I'll be placing a bit of green and some red as well, but using a wet brush to mix them on the paper. This strategy may seem uh, awkward at first, but um, one of the beauties of this strategy is that it gives you a very rich color at the end, a brilliant color, and things happen along the way when you're mixing using water that you could never do on the palette. You get uh, diffusions and edges that create their own beauty. So there's a lot of reasons to mix your color on the paper. Well, to return to the idea of a, of a mother color, when we are building up the color in this way, we can bring this color to, to work. In this case, yellow, orange will be kind of figuring into all the mixtures that I place in the foliage above. Um, identifying a, a mother color can really eliminate a lot of confusion when you're on, uh, on location or um, give you some guidance for um, colors that you may want to use, uh, colors that identify a specific uh, passage, etc. And uh, also, th this uh, identifying the mother color will give you um, the complementary hue. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about complementary hues in that uh, PDF that I have, uh, have in the description below. 
but a complementary hue is basically the color that's on the other side of the color wheel. So if you look at a color wheel and you point out yellow, uh, you'll look on the opposite side and you'll see violet. If you point out orange, on the opposite side, opposite side will be blue. So the, uh, the knowledge of the complementary hue can be practical as well because <clears throat> it will, if you place it in approximation to, um, to each other, the complementary hues, they excite or they amplify each other. So this is um, sort of a phenomenology of color that the painter uses to uh, make the painting feel stronger or more vibrant. And um, here we're primarily using that that uh, warm hue, the bright orange, bright yellow combination mixed with a few reds and a few greens. But in essence, we're painting with these bright hues all above the bridge. And as I go to uh, build up the color below, uh, below the bridge, I'm leaving the white of the paper, but I'm going to use a similar strategy and um, take from color that's above a lot of warm hues and place them into the water below, painting the water below. The difference here though is my, my eventual goal is to allow this color to shine through a future layer. So this is what we might call an, an underpainting in that it's going to be covered uh, eventually by another wash. And we did that in our exercise, if you remember. We made some swatches of color and we layered color on top of each other. We layered a um, green on top of a red and we observed and we understood how that underpainting affected the eventual color. So I'm utilizing some of that uh, information in the underpainting. I'm painting with warm hues, in some case a, a lot of alizarin uh, towards the back there, with the knowledge that I'm going to return to the painting in a successive layer and mute those colors, but still um, allow them to come through. Uh, that's the, one of the beauties of transparent watercolor that you don't see as uh, readily in more opaque medium is that we can really play upon transparency. Well, I'm returning to the upper stage, which is dried, and you notice that I'm placing some dark hues. What I'm doing now is basically giving a form to the foliage. Um, the initial stage is, is painted more as a shape, more as a flat shape, and I'm looking for, of course, the the edges of that shape to give me a reference, but now I'm going into that shape and dividing it, uh, pulling out willow trees, pulling out uh, the maple trees, giving a feeling of the direction of light. And I'll continue this all the way across the top of the painting, allowing the bottom to dry. And um, Along the way, I can I can be free about this. I'm I'm actually putting a little more dark in this area now because eventually I want to place a lamp post here, a bright lamp post. So I'm going dark behind that area with the expectation that uh, when I paint a paint a bright lamp post on top of that dark, it's really going to be visible, quite visible. And I continue to model the shapes of trees using basically a combination of those same colors, just mixed with a little less water and mixed on the palette. So I'm painting with a, a gray that's made up of cadmium red light and cobalt turquoise, as well as a little bit of viridian green and a little bit of alizarin. And uh, depending how strong or how dark I want the passage to be, uh, I will use more Viridian or more Alizarin. But it, it is pretty thoroughly mixed, so there's not a, a sharp accent of color that's painted into these gray tones. And now you can start to see the, the effect of modeling or how we start to feel one section come forward and another section recede.
all the while these colors have a component of the underpainting. So the color remains very consistent in all of these passages. And in fact, it's very much the same four colors that we did our drill with. If you remember the drill, we used um, CAD Red Light, which you see me placing here into the column of the bridge, very bright CAD Red Light, and uh, Cobalt Turquoise. And here I'm placing the these colors onto the, the um, columns of the bridge and I'm going to go below with a little turquoise and then blend them by dragging one up into the other. So this is a little, maybe seems a little unorthodox, but it's a way that uh, the watercolorist can generate uh, interesting colors, variety in color, while still keeping uh, an integrity about the painting. If we restrict our palette as we have, and it's a very colorful palette because we're using our colors in a rather pure form, but it's still a restricted palette. We're using four colors, basically, to build this painting. And here you can see the result of that particular wash, where we've dragged a, a bit of water up to meet the red and a bit of water down to meet the green, and they kind of blend and mix to our... Um, need along the middle. And here's where I'm going to apply a little bit of the um, complementary hue. Uh, kind of bluish green is going to be washed over the bridge. And that blue green is complementary, complementing uh, the abundance of warm colors, the abundance of reds and oranges and, and uh, yellows that are really dominating the painting. So this hopefully has the effect of uh, making these colors feel a little brighter or a little, a little more energetic, let's use that word. And uh, complementary hues are effective in this way. And the, we don't want the complementary hue to take over the painting, so um, we'll use it sparsely to give accents and a reference to some of the local color as well as to make these oranges and reds shimmer a little more. Throughout this uh, series, you've heard me talk about uh, the hue, the hue of a, a color, the uh, value of a color, and occasionally you'll hear me talk about the chromatic aspect of a color. Uh, these terms might be new to you, so let me just give you a quick uh, definition of what I mean. When I'm talking about the hue, it's basically the name that we give the color. So now I'm painting with a, a red hue, or the hue that I'm painting with is red. When I talk about the value of a color, that means it's lightness or it's darkness. How dark does it get? How light is it? Could be any color that we're talking about or even any gray. And um, we're talking about the tonal value. And then there's a chromatic aspect. And the chromatic aspect is basically talking about the purity of that color, any one color. So that in the foliage above, you see areas that have a very high chromatic aspect, a pure red or a pure green or a pure yellow. And in other places where they mix and blend and diffuse, these colors are of a lower chromatic aspect. In other words, not as pure. So the, these are the three properties of any one color that we're painting. And uh, are useful to us to kind of have a conversation about color and understand it, what it is we're talking about. But for me, the most um, important aspect of color is the tonal aspect, the lightness or darkness of any one color. And I say this because understanding um, 
your painting from a point of view of lights and darks gives you a big advantage, especially when you're trying to create a center of interest or lead the, the eye of the audience or bring a certain drama or a certain mood. Uh, knowledge of how tonal values can do this will be a great help to you. And um, in fact, the color becomes a very flexible element in the equation. In other words, we can paint this same scene with a, a dominance of greens and uh, complement it with some violets. And if our tonal values are correct, the mood might change a little bit, but the paint painting can still be a strong piece and um, still move us and still give us a good feeling and still have unity. So color is very flexible. And I think this exercise might be pointing that out to you where you can see I'm, I'm really improvising with color. Um, I'm taking, I'm not even looking at uh, the image anymore. I'm just taking what I know, know about the scene and what I've kind of assessed about the scene and then sort of improvising with the color and watching what happens on the paper and trying to be responsive to that. So the property of the hue, the hue uh, which is a property of the color, is a very flexible part of the, part of the equation in any one painting. The tonal value is a very major part of the equation. And the chromatic aspect is um, also a minor part of the equation. We can, we can play with that as you see me doing in this painting. Well, let's get back to what I'm doing here technically. Technically what I'm doing now, you didn't notice that sheen on the paper. That tells you the painting's very wet at this stage. And I'm painting wet into wet and uh, trying to place a, a complementary hue um, in the form of a, a wet and wet passage. I'm using, in this case, um, red and green mixed together on the palette to give me sort of a warm gray. And as this uh, passage uh, spreads out or moves down, uh, the colors separate a bit too, which gives us uh, an even more interesting painting. When the colors separate just due to the fact that they're being painted with watercolor. So watercolor creates its own signature in every painting and it requires a little sacrifice of control on our part, but the benefit is well worth it when we can see watercolor doing its thing and creating passages, uh, especially when it's um, bleeding or migrating or uh, diffusing. Uh, that is a very exciting passage in any painting, and uh, it's making use of the nature of watercolor. I guess that's an important piece of the puzzle, something I should add on as we kind of take advantage of the nature of watercolor. So. I continue to add uh, to this wet area. Um, my board is at a slight angle, um, so the color's kind of running down, as you notice, giving me a vertical feeling to this wash, which is, is, is suitable because I'm painting water. I'm painting reflections on the water, and I do want some of that dripping. I want some of that migration of color to happen. So. Tilting the board, having my board at an angle allows for this. Also, occasionally taking a water bottle and, and just sending a fine mist to that wet, wet area will allow the color to creep down a little bit. Adding some real rich tones here. And uh, it's really hard to... Um, kind of guess or estimate how this is going to dry. I think that's one of the frustrations when you're getting into this media is that it dries often much paler than than when you apply the color. And in fact, uh, I've heard one teacher say that if it looks good, it's wrong. So what that means is, you know, when you're painting and you're kind of adjusting the color, if it looks good, then it's going to dry 
paler and you might feel the need to restate it. So in this case, um, it's looking a little dark, so I'm hoping that that uh, works out to my benefit so that it dries um, looking proper, looking like it fits to the rest of the painting. And in essence, what uh, this passage that I'm adding now is doing, you see me working above and below at the same time, is I'm extending or co uh, connecting the darks of the painting. At the same time, I'm bringing out figures or other details to the upper section. Uh, but in large part, this dark that I'm winding along the bottom and up into the lower parts of the trees is connecting the dark and giving a feeling of integrity to this passage. If it's too scattered and too disjointed, it it lacks that. So I'm, I'm making an effort to connect it while I see it. Well, the painting is starting to assume a rather finished quality. We'll see when this uh, lower section dries off what we need to do, but um, and as it dries, it's uh, it's interesting to watch it as it dries because notice how those colors start to come through just a little more. It has dried now, and my guess was pretty good. I think the dark tones are are settling in. I feel I did get a little dark with some of the uh, stronger elements I placed in the trees. So I've got a wet brush and basically you see me scrubbing and lifting. I'm kind of adjusting the tonality of the mark and maybe softening the edges a little bit. Uh, this is a pretty common thing at this stage in the painting is to kind of go back and forth between adding color and adjusting color to get the balance that I'm looking for. But I'm pleased with the overall image, the kind of um, mother color that runs through the painting, the accents of highly chromatic hues that uh, are on some of the edges of the trees, the glow of the warm color coming through the wash below, and, as, and I've left parts of the, some small parts of the underpainting coming through and I believe this gives it gives a it plays on that glowing aspect in other words you see the slanted marks running down the slope behind the bridge or the edge of a curb under the bridge or a vertical mark on the water of that pure underpainting this uh, gives a feedback to that undercolor and I believe it heightens the glowing aspect that we see in the watercolor at this point so I'll, I'll work at this stage of adjusting until I feel ready to make some final adds. One thing that um, I'll, I'll need to do is, you know, the, notice the green of the bridge is a little flat. It's a little um, too strong. Or it's kind of floating on the page. Maybe that's a better way to put it. And my in my mind what I intend to do is to take a gray color made from these two hues of cad red light and cobalt turquoise and to wash over parts of the the bridge so that that green settles in also so that I can make the figure stand out a little more and some of the architectural elements of the bridge come out just a little more as well So one of the things that I haven't talked about um, too much is um, some of the tricky aspects of painting from a motif or on location uh, related to color. One of the things that I'll mention now is uh, it's our kind of our habit or our training maybe even to to chase color by that I mean we see a color in front of us and we place it on the paper and we adjust it until it's perfect and we move to the next color and the next color and so on and uh, this can be this can really slow us down and take our focus away from the whole picture or the big picture and it eventually can lead to a lot of frustration because we know that 
um, for matching color or chasing color. Uh, sometimes the color dries lighter and looks differently than when we painted it, or the light changes and affects the color, or uh, any number of things can happen where um, it can, can take us off track if we're chasing color. So I feel it's a better strategy to have a limited palette, and that palette is based on a mother hue or dominant hue in the painting, I'm sorry, in the motif, and a complementary hue, and um, go about the painting in this way. Um, it requires a bit of experience, perhaps, to, to do this effectively, but um, I say this now because I think it'll be helpful when, when you're facing similar challenges in nature to uh, remind yourself of what the major color is and let that figure into all of your mixtures. Keep your palette rather simple and avoid the temptation to chase color. I think that could, could and does lead to a lot of frustration. So those are some of the strategies that I have in working with color and and uh, while this uh, is a painting of a scene, it's very much of an improvisation also because I limited my palette, I had in mind uh, what the major hue was, and I knew how to complement that hue, and I was very keen on, on getting the light, the feeling of light and the feeling of autumn, and a feeling of glowing color in the lower, lower section. And... Uh, employ some of the techniques that we discovered in the drill that we did earlier. So I hope this is helpful to you. And again, I would check out the description below this video for the PDF file that gives you additional information on color and uh, puts some of the information that I was narrating into perhaps a better form, more understandable form. Also, there's some links to other videos that I've done that explore color in the same way. And uh, other information as well. So uh, please take the time to look below in the description. Anyway, that's all I have for you now. We'll see you again in the future.